If you could take your seats, we'd like to begin with our second plenary lecture. And I would ask you to uh, remain seated after the lecture because there will be the usual long list of announcements which I would like to make. Uh, this morning's plenary lecture will be introduced by Leo Manzer, Leo's Associate Director of Engineering and Catalysis R&D at DuPont. Uh, but my real goal or, or intent here is to recognize his contributions to our organization. He's our treasurer. And every time we, we thought we had a grant plan or scheme that was going to put us in the red, he would uh, run his balance sheet and tell us that was a no-no. He's continued to do that right through our, our daily breakfasts. And we're very grateful for him for thanking our change now and again. And we hope he continues to do it and, and, it, and it all works out and we're in the black. So I give you Leo Manzer, our treasure. And then work into uh, the work that we've done at Dow, 
with what we call a constrained geometry called open the calcine catalyst. Go into some of the chemistry of the uh, catalysis itself, the generation of cationic discrete catalyst species. And then uh, something that's going to be quite a bit different, I think, for this audience, uh, which is mostly a heterogeneous conference, go into a bit of polymer chemistry and uh, then wrap it up with some commercial implications. Um, because this is mostly a heterogeneous conference, I thought I'd better take just a few minutes and talk about what, uh, what the different polyethylenes and polyolefins are. I'm going to focus my talk on polyethylene because that's where the majority of our work in Dallas has been. Uh, there's really three major kinds up to this point of polyethylene. We make a uh, small Dow. The, the first kind of polyethylene that was commercialized was low density polyethylene. It's made an extremely interesting process. It's been around since about the 1930s where ethylene is compressed to extremely high pressure, say 40, 30 to 40,000 PSI. Radicals are added or oxygen, and uh, it's basically a controlled detonation taking place in either a tubular reactor or a tank reactor. And because there's radicals running all over the place at very high temperature, you get a lot of radical recombinations, and you end up with a very dendritic-like material, uh, like a tree root, uh, called low-density polyethylene. And that's been, uh, a huge volume of business for a long time. Then in the 50s, Ziegler came out with the Ziegler Nata catalyst that were very successful. They take uh, ethylene and instead of making this very dendritic structure, string it together in a long linear chain that crystallizes very, very well. And uh, that became the big polymer of the 50s. In the 70s, a new twist was added to the Ziegler Nata uh, catalyst. And then, just keep going. There you get there. A uh, co-monomer was added. We use octene and Dow, but there's a, a lot of different uh, commercial products that are made with butene, hexene, etc. And the idea here is you're making a copolymer of ethylene with a larger alpha olefin. You get a, basically a linear chain with the alpha olefin as a short chain branch coming off the linear chain. The short chain branch acts to screw up the crystallization of the polymer, and you end up with increased amounts of amorphous regions that add toughness and uh, Uh, a couple of things, just to go over some important uh, features of polyethylene. I've tried to show here, unfortunately, in this slide, I think it's going to be pretty dim in the back, a uh, correlation between the amount of co-monomer that's added and the density. The density goes down as we add more and more co-monomer. Going from homopolymer, it crystallizes extremely well, and you end up with a very high density material. The density of the uh, crystalline fraction is about one gram per mil and the density of the amorphous fraction of polyethylene is very low, about 0.83 or 85 grams per milliliter. So as we increase the amount of co-monomer, we increase the amount of amorphous fractions, and you end up with a lower and lower density product. What effect that has on the polymer properties, we go from high density polyethylene to linear low, <laughs> and the density drops down, which is a few percent of co-monomer, to what's called very low or ultra low density polyethylene. Finally, you start to lose a lot of crystal energy and end up with a material called a plastomer. And eventually, if you knock all the crystal energy out, you end up with uh, elastomeric material. Uh, conversely, looking at molecular weight, as the molecular weight goes up, there's this uh, important property known as the melt index that's uh, used in the polymer uh, industry. And an important relationship here is as the molecular weight goes up, the melt index goes down. Melt index is basically a single point rheological measurement where it's a measure of how rapidly the polymer can be extruded through a very small die under a specified set of conditions. If we look at what the traditional polyolefin catalyst for polyethylene have been like uh, over the years, the Ziegler Natta catalyst or the Phillips type chromium catalyst, it's uh, generally on a support with either titanium or chromium. They're activated with various alkyl aluminums to get kind of a witch's brew of a relatively poorly understood catalytic mixture. And one of the features of these catalysts is there's a tremendous diversity of different active sites on the actual catalyst particle. And each of these different sites generates a different kind of polymer molecule. So you end up with, out of the reactor, basically a blend or mixture of different polymer molecules generated by the different sites. And typically, you get a site that generates a very high density fraction. In other words, it's almost completely ethylene homopolymer, very highly crystalline, 
and that tends to be extremely high molecular weight. You get a medium molecular weight fraction that has uh, a relatively moderate amount of co-monomer, and then you get a fraction that's very low density. In other words, it has a tremendous amount of co-monomer, and that tends to be very low molecular weight. And if, if you were a material scientist, that's not how you would design uh, your polymer. It turns out that elastomers or elastomeric material have better properties when they're high molecular weight. And here, the elastomeric materials, the low density materials, are relatively low molecular weight. The polymer molecules that have very little crystal, uh, little homonomer, in other words, they're high crystallinity, are high molecular weight with these catalysts, and that's not the way you would design a resin either. Because the strength with those molecules comes from crystallinity, there's no need to have those. Another feature of the Ziegler Nav and traditional catalyst is that the rate of reaction of ethylene is very, very much faster than the rate of reaction of higher alcohol. Several orders of magnitude higher, in fact. Uh, we make a lot of uh, ethylene octene copolymer. In order to get about a 2 to 3 mole percent octene in the polymer, we might have 50 to 60 weight percent octene in the reactor. So ethylene is very, very much more reactive than the higher alcohol. We at Dow run a solution process to pump used to until they sold the business a number of years ago uh, and others. And the process basically is polymerization in uh, consider it in hot kerosene. Uh, it's an important feature that the reactor temperature must be very high uh, in order to stay in solution because the polyethylene will crystallize. And uh, believe me, if that happens in your big solution reactor, you've got a really big problem. You end up with a giant blob of polymer in the bottom and workers have to go in with chainsaws basically to cut it up. So you definitely do not want to run at low temperature. And in fact, it's economically favorable to run as hot as possible. The reactors are essentially adiabatic. And so the hotter you're running, the more CC bonds per unit time per unit reactor you're making. Also, it's easier to remove the solvent if it's inherently coming out of the, of the reactor very, very hot. So running hot is good, running cold is bad in solution. Another feature, you can achieve very, very high conversion with these reactors, and the amount of ethylene that needs to be recycled is very low. The residence time is very short. The catalysts get in there, bang, they do their job in a couple of minutes, and then they're, uh, they're dead, or if they're not dead, they're killed at the exit of the reactor. And uh, because the efficiency is so high, the, the catalyst residues are left in the polymer. A feature of solution polymerization is because it's in solution, any alcohol of them is theoretically possible if it goes in solution. Any alcohol that I'm aware of will go into, uh, into hot kerosene. Uh, a problem though is ultra high molecular weight is tough. Because we're running in solution, the solution viscosity can get very, very high if you make extremely high molecular weight. So that's a limitation of this process. The other really big process in the world is one uh, in the gas phase. In fact, there's considerably more gas phase uh, capacity in the world for polyethylene and polypropylene than there is in solution. And basically, it's a fluidized bed of that the reactor temperature be kept low. If the reactor temperature gets up to the melting point of the polymer, the whole fluidized bed collapses down into a giant blob and they have to go into the overhead crane and pull out this million pound pellet, which uh, would be bad. The conversion per pass is relatively low, but uh, the conversion throughout the reactor is relatively high. The resident time is relatively long. And uh, up until relatively recently, you had to use a volatile novel olefins such as butene or hexene with the new boiling bed technology that's, uh, that's coming online. That's not the case. You can go to higher up molten now. Uh, a feature of the gas phase process is the energy cost is relatively low, unless you need to melt uh, an extruded pellet <coughs> product. But again, because they use these Ziegler nanotype catalysts, the rate of reaction of ethylene is substantially higher than the rate of reaction of uh, the colon part. And because it's in the gas phase, there's no molecular weight limitation. You can make infinite molecular because the, uh, the viscosity is not a problem. Well, along comes these single site catalysts. Actually, they've been known for a while. And it's the distinction between single site catalysts and traditional Ziegler Natic catalysts, as I mentioned, there's a diversity of active sites on the Ziegler Natic catalyst, different oxidation states. It's postulated that the metal is in the plus two, the plus three, and the plus four oxidation state, as well as different physical sites on the support that generates this mixture of different molecular weights and different compositions, generating basically a blend type polymer product. The 
these single side catalysts, every active site or every active center is the same. So all the polymer chains are statistically identical in composition. They give a relatively narrow molecular weight distribution. It's not a living polymerization. And actually, that's good because a living polymerization ends up with one catalyst molecule generating one polymer molecule. And with the cost of these metallocene catalysts, that would end up with a very, very expensive product. Actually, metallocene polymerization catalysts have been known since the late 50s when Breslow and Newberg published this uh, work in JAX. They took titanocene dichloride, bis-cyclopentadienyl titanium dichloride, activated with uh, diethyl aluminum chloride and ethylene, generated this uh, oscillated deuterionic species, where chlorine has been removed, generating a cationic titanium center and this uh, aluminum anion. And it generated polyethylene with narrow molecular weight distribution and narrow composition distribution. Uh, it had extremely low efficiency, however. The efficiency was several grams per gram of catalyst, so you end up with a catalyst built uh, polymer. It was a very interesting uh, academically, but commercially, no one would be interested in selling $100 pound, uh, uh, $100 a pound polyethylene. But all the chains were the same. Uh, they got several patents in the area. More recently, uh, numerous groups have been working in this area. Pat Watson, John Burkhoff, Tobin Mars, many others have studied this CP metal neutral species, such as I've shown here. But the big breakthrough really came when uh, Walter Kaminsky in Germany uh, started publishing work with what's now known as the Kaminsky catalyst. This is a bis cyclopentadienyl zirconium, zirconosine compound, activated with MAO. And it was a really interesting material. Uh, it's generated by the hydrolysis of trimethyl aluminum. As you can imagine, that's a real exciting reaction. Directly adding water to trimethyl aluminum generates a tremendous amount of heat and uh, gas release. But you end up with this oligomeric mixture of approximate stoichiometry ALO methyl, and it's a polymeric or oligomeric material. But the feature of this Kaminsky catalyst over the earlier Breslau Newberg system is that it's extremely high efficiency. You can get millions of pounds of polyethylene per pound of uh, active metal, uh, which is very different from the Breslau Newberg system. Under solution polymerization, like we run at now, unfortunately, where you're running at very high temperature and very high conversion, and high conversion have relatively low ethylene concentration, you end up with very low molecular weight. Uh, molecular weights are just a couple of thousand. So that's a problem for us anyway. Uh, the molecular weight distribution is narrow, though, indicating sickle site behavior. Another problem commercially is that these catalysts require a relatively large amount of this uh, MAO co-catalyst. The best efficiency is seen with ratios of aluminum to zirconium of about 1,000 to 1 or higher. Uh, but Kaminsky really pioneered the way in this single site catalysis. Once people could see the high efficiency that you could obtain with these catalysts, uh, all of the commercial companies started becoming some of the general features of the catalyst. The activity generally follows the trend of zirconium is more active than hafnium, which is much, much more active than titanium. Uh, molecular weight of the polymers, the hafnium gives the highest molecular weight followed by titanium and zirconium. And the polarization with hafnium is complicated by the near universal uh, contamination, if you will, of hafnium with zirconium. And because the, the hafnium gives higher molecular weight, but the zirconium is more active, even a small amount of, uh, of zirconium in your hafnium catalyst will generate uh, a substantial amount of polymer. Another problem, as I mentioned before, is this MAO is relatively expensive. About 300 bucks a pound, actually, since I made this slide, I think the price has come down to about $200 a pound. But because you need to use 1,000 equivalents of that, approximately, for uh, transition metal, you're looking at a substantial catalyst cost. And the polyethylene business is one that uh, a few pennies a pound and increased cost is going to cut off a lot of your customers. Uh, also, because of the high aluminum content, you can end up with a lot of aluminum in the polymer and basically generate an in-situ alumina filled uh, material. Even with some of these problems, there's a tremendous number of advantages to catalysts such as this. A wide range of Monomers can be polymerized much wider than is 
accessible with the conventional particular data type system. And as I mentioned, because they're single site catalysts, all of the polymer chains are basically the same. You don't get this distribution of different polymer species. You get a very narrow molecular weight distribution and a narrow composition distribution. In other words, all the chains have the same amount of polymer. You don't get the high density fraction and the low density fraction. They're all it's easy to control the amount of terminal unsaturation, and that turns out to be a very important part of the story that I'm going to go into with our inside technology polymers. We turn that into long chain branching. Uh, but the highest degree of importance for these new catalysts is the great degree, degree of logical structure property control. You can sit down and craft and design a catalyst to do exactly what you want based on uh, relatively simple principles. And that's resulted in a lot of new materials coming out. You can make uh, logically isotactic syndiotactic or atactic polymers if you use higher alpha-olefins. And you can predict and control what's going on. And prediction and control is extremely valuable in this business. Just to show you up in the back, you can't see this very well. Uh, this is just a partial list of some of the monitors that have been successfully polymerized with these catalysts to date. It includes ethylene, propylene, all the normal alpha-olefins, a lot of dienes, and interestingly, aromatics can be polymerized very well. Styrene can be co-polymerized with ethylene, something that was very tough to do in the past. Styrene is a monomer that likes to be free radical polymerized. Ethylene does not uh, particularly free radical polymerize well. But with these new catalysts, you can co-polymerize ethylene and styrene very nicely. Uh, you can polymerize styrene to make semiotactic polystyrene. You can polymerize a lot of uh, cyclic monomers, such, such as cyclopentene, cyclobutene, norbornene, and end up with some for example, I mentioned these methylene or morning copolymers. Uh, Herbs and Mitsui are currently commercializing these under the topaz or ACOL name. Uh, and by controlling the amount of norborning and ethylene, because the norborning inserts and gives a very rigid, unfortunately you can't see very well, a very rigid uh, monomer in the backbone, you get a very high PG. And by controlling the relative amount of these two, you can control the heat deflection temperature over a wide range, up to about 170 degrees C. So now we've got a completely hydrocarbon, uh, no crystallinity, amorphous material with uh, very good optical properties, very low biorefringence, and these are going to be really big, I think, in CD and other optical applications. They have no water absorption because they're very nonpolar, and they mold very well. They have some tremendous properties. Uh, as I mentioned, ethylene styrene is kind of a new combination. We have that in a pilot plant right now. And again, by varying the proportion of ethylene and styrene, you can dial the PG and modulus over a very wide range, going from a solid uh, uh, thermoplastic material through an elastomer and then to a um, real interesting material at high styrene that behaves in many ways like polyvinyl chloride. A distinctive feature of these catalysts is the ability to control the monomer reactivity. Uh, as I mentioned before, traditional Ziegler-Natic catalysts, ethylene is much, much more reactive than the uh, higher alpha-olefins. The kinetic R1 uh, copolymerization constant, typically ethylene is 100 to 1,000 times more reactive than the higher alpha-olefins. Yet with our new catalyst, this is our, one of our constrained geometry type catalysts that I'm going to talk about. The reactivity ratio between ethylene and octane is about four, so it's about two orders of magnitude more reactive to higher alpha olefin relative to ethylene than the standard Ziegler Natic catalyst. But by changing the metal and changing the ligands around it with a metallocene, you can get uh, a reactivity ratio that's essentially infinity. You can get a catalyst now that, in the presence of uh, ethylene and a co-monomer such as hexene, will selectively pull all of the ethylene out of solution. So if you really wanted to get ethylene out of ultra pure, ultra dry uh, hexene, this might be a good way to do it. But the bottom line is you can control the reactivity of the monomer by logically changing the structure. I mentioned narrow molecular weight distribution. This shows a uh, GDC curve of a typical Ziegler nano, one of our Daleks, uh, mag chloride supported ethylene octane copolymers, has a molecular weight distribution of about four. That used to be considered a relatively narrow molecular weight distribution. With our inside technology, single site, the policy, we get a molecular weight distribution of around two. And what we've done basically is cut out the ultra high molecular weight molecules and the low molecular weight molecules. Low molecular weight doesn't contribute anything to the physical properties, and the high molecular weight molecules uh, make the resin relatively difficult to process. This may not look 
not much of a difference, but it actually has very profound, uh, very profound effects on the polymer. Because you can narrow the molecular weight distribution, you get better toughness, lower hexene extractables if you were going to uh, use this in some food contact application. Uh, because you lose the low molecular weight molecules, you get better odor and taste properties, so films of this uh, polyethylene tend to smell better. Uh, you get a more homogeneous cross-link network and better cross-linking efficiency because you have an even distribution of the molecular weights. In addition to controlling the molecular weights, you can control, as I mentioned, the homomer distribution. Um, this green curve shows a, a technique known as P-TREP, where the molecules are fractionated based on their crystallinity, which is a function of how much homomer is in the molecule. Uh, this high temperature fraction, this high density fraction, these are molecules that have relatively no or very little homomer. Uh, it's about 30% of the overall polymer. Then there's this wide band of molecules that have various amounts of homomer. And finally down here at the end, there's the very greasy, very low molecular weight, high homonomer molecules. And that's the typical composition of a regular Ziegler, Ziegler nanotype polymer. By going to single site catalysis, we can generate polymer molecules now that all of the polymer molecules we lose over a very narrow range. So they all have the same composition. All the molecules have statistically the same amount of homonomer. And we can control that over a very wide range, making all molecules that are high density, all molecules that have any degree of homonomer incorporation that we want. And what that leads to is better optical properties, better elastic properties, lower heat seal, and other things that people who actually buy millions of pounds of polymer uh, like to see. As I mentioned, the calcines allow you to control terminal and saturation. Because they predominantly uh, terminate by beta hydride elimination, wherein a hydride beta to the metal is, is transferred to the titanium, and from the titanium hydride and the vinyl terminated polymer, you can control this by controlling the temperature of the reactor. And it's possible to end up with uh, all the polymer chains having terminal and saturation. You can use that to post derivatize. Uh, everybody knows chemistry that you can do with vinyl groups. Uh, what we do with our insight technology is used in reactor incorporation of these uh, vinyl terminated polymer chains as a very large one. If you're making higher alkalosin, it's possible to control the toxicity of the polymer. I think a very beautiful piece of work by John Ewan was uh, he logically predicted that this catalyst with CS symmetry uh, should give syndiotactic polypropylene. Uh, the monomer of the propylene comes in always orienting away from large fluoronyl group. This is the fluoronyl isopropylidine CPs or chromium bichloride. And because the monomer always comes in pointing away from the large group toward the small group, and the chain with each insertion is wagging back and forth in a simple way of thinking at it, you end up with syndiotactic or regularly alternating stereochemically polypropylene. And high syndiotactic polypropylene has not been known before. Dina is now uh, attempting to commercialize this. And Grinzinger and others have uh, changed the stereochemistry from CS to C2 symmetry with this rack ethane bis endonyl or tetrahydroendonyl zirconium bichloride. Now with C2 symmetry, you get the opposite situation where the uh, propylenes insert with the same stereochemical configuration for every insertion, and you end up with isotactic polypropylene. And a real beautiful piece of work that's come out recently, Weymouth group at Stanford have taken advantage of this fact with a catalyst that is not uh, linked together, so these groups are free to spin about with this phenyl in the nail zirconium system. And in this stereo configuration during the polymerization, it has C2 symmetry, so you end up with an isotactic block. This rate of isomerization or spinning of one of these uh, CP rings to this CS symmetry configuration, which leads to an atactic block. And with propylene as the only monomer, you can generate a thermoplastic elastomer with alternating blocks of uh, tactic and atactic elastomeric regions from uh, propylene as the only monomer. I think it's a real beautiful piece of work. Well, I'm going to switch gears a little bit now and tell you about the work that we've done at Dow on what we call our constrained geometry catalyst system. 
The idea here is unlike the previous work with Kaminsky that used two CP rings, we've got a single cyclopentadiene or monocyclopentadiene complex that's variously substituted. And instead of another CP, we replaced it with uh, a good ligand, an anionic or neutral donor of some sort, and covalently attached it to the single CP ring. The bidentate ligand stabilizes the metal electronically, which is very important for the high temperature solution process. We need a catalyst that has stability at high temperature, at least for several minutes while it runs some polarization. Yet the short covalent bridge opens up one face of the catalyst, so hysterically it's relatively wide open. And that has some very important consequences. Uh, there's a lot of places on this molecule where an organometallic chemist can get in there and do the substitution. You can substitute groups on the ring, you can substitute this bridging group, the other coordinating group, uh, as well as all of the, uh, the functionality around here. And it all has very profound effects on the type of polymer that you make. In general, looking at these catalysts, because they're sterically relatively wide open, the polyalpha olefins uh, are generally atactic, but very slightly semiotactic. For example, we got 69% R for polypropylene. Perfectly atactic would be 50% essentially a tactic. Uh, yet a distinctive feature is they copolymerize an extremely wide variety of alpha olefins with ethylene. And they incorporate them in enormous amounts, unlike the normal Ziegler data type catalyst, where ethylene is much, much more reactive than the higher alpha olefins. With these catalysts, the alpha olefins are incorporated in enormous amounts. The catalyst activity is quite good under solution conditions. For the work I'm going to start out showing you with MAO, the efficiency is about 150 to 750,000 grams of polymer per gram of transition metal, which for an academic type polymerization would be great. It turns out commercially, uh, commercial application, this is not quite good enough. Uh, and I'll tell you how we fix that. Uh, the efficiency depends on the temperature specific catalyst, aluminum level, and uh, numerous other features. So let's look at uh, some of these catalysts. Here's a crystal structure of a tetramethyl cyclopentadiene dimethylsilo bridge with an amide group that's n butylamide o titanium dichloride. And all the bond distances are quite normal for a, uh, a mono CP titanium complex. But one of the distinctive features is there's a tremendous amount of ring strain built up into the pseudo four member ring uh, from the CP to the silane to the amide and the titanium. Uh, the silicon has been pulled out of the CP plane by nearly an angstrom because of this uh, covalent attachment to the metal. The nitrogen, if we were to cleave this bond here, the nitrogen would probably reside up here with a bond angle of 115 to 120 degrees. So by covalently attaching it to the CP ring with a very short bridge, we pull that down with all this ring strain and open up the active site where the polymerization is going to occur. If we look at a slightly different uh, version with a somewhat longer bridge, go to a dimethylene bridge. Uh, the titanium can fit more over the center. There's a lot less strain built up in here. And the angle now between the metal, the CP, and the uh, nitrogen is opened up just a little bit from 107 to 108 degrees with this one. And if we lengthen the bridge even further now with a disiline bridge, uh, this nitrogen is in its normal position, the angle is about 120 degrees now from the center of the CP to the titanium and the nitrogen. And that has very profound effects on the catalysis as I'm going to show you now. Uh, these are some batch reactive polymerizations at various temperatures. And a couple of features I want to point out here. First off, we're running at relatively high temperature, 160 degrees in solution. Uh, the this CP catalyst would make very low molecular weight under these high temperatures. They were making decent molecular weight, about 50,000 MSW. The melt index is about 10, which is right in the commercial range. A lot of our commercial polymers fall in the melt index between about half and uh, 100. So this would be a great uh, resin commercially with useful molecular weight. As we increase the temperature, you can see the molecular weight goes down. So we're getting increased levels of beta hydroelimination. Uh, that'll be very important when I tell you how we use that to incorporate uh, the alpha olefins to make long chain branching. Another feature is these runs were done with hydrogen. You can see if we remove the hydrogen, it has an effect on the melt index. Uh, with no hydrogen, the melt index is substantially lower. Remember, the melt index is inversely related to molecular weight. So we can independently control molecular weight with hydrogen and pepper. 
temperature. If you lower the reactor temperature somewhat and increase the amount of co-monomer, you can generate materials now. These are ethylene octane co-polymers with fabulously low density. Density is of about 0.85 grams per milliliter. With the old technology, a singular nanotype catalyst, it used to be 0.92 grams per milliliter was considered low density polyethylene, and 0.90 grams per milliliter was ultra low density polyethylene. So this would be ultra, 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 ultra low, or mega low density polyethylene. Uh, polyethylene with this low density has really uh, never really been seen before. And yet we can make it with extremely high molecular weight. The melt indices can be uh, so, so low that the polymer doesn't extrude at all. So very high molecular weight, very high co-monomer filtration. If we look at what effect the different catalyst uh, structures have on the uh, polymerization, going from relatively electron donating groups, tetramethyl CP around the, uh, the CP, the regular tetra HCP and then benzo CP are in the nil of constrained geometry catalyst. You can see the efficiency drops off as we uh, increase the electron withdrawing ability of the ligand, and the amount of co-monomer uh, incorporated decreases as shown by the increase in density, and the molecular weight goes up. So by, by controlling the amount of electron density at the metal, we can control the amount of co-monomer that's incorporated and the molecular weight very, very nicely. We see interesting effects when you change the bridge going from the long bridge the disidal bridge with, has, with a very uh, non-acute angle of 120 degrees between the CP ring, the metal, and the amide group. The efficiency is very low, but hardly any homomer is incorporated. This is the density of essentially has the homo polymer. If we go to shorter and shorter bridges, the uh, single silo and the, eth the ethane bridge species, we get much higher efficiency and much more homomer incorporated. The, uh, CH2 bridge species gives the best combination of, uh, of electron donating and uh, open sterics, and we get extremely high efficiency in this case and a uh, very high molecular weight. And looking at the different metals, uh, in contrast to this CP system, the Kaminsky catalyst, with a constrained geometry mono CP system, the titanium always gives higher efficiency and much more homonomer incorporated than does the analogous uh, zirconium system. And this is a, just another handle. By changing the metal now, we can change the, uh, the polymer properties completely. So to wrap up these structure property type relationships, the constrained geometry catalyst with very acute constrained angles between the, the, the CP and the other donor produce high molecular weight polymers, very efficient homonomer incorporation, we can change the electron donating substituents in order to improve the catalyst efficiency. Titanium derivatives produce catalysts with the highest efficiency and much more efficient homonomer incorporation. And from a, a resin design, the most important feature is that the catalyst can be controlled to give a desired result. Uh, but a problem that I mentioned before is this MAO co-catalyst gives relatively modest efficiency. Uh, when I was in grad school, if we got 500,000 grams per gram, we'd have been real happy. Uh, but commercially, because this MAO is relatively expensive and you need so much of it, um, that's going to be a problem selling polyethylene, which is a low commodity resin. Also, the reaction of trimethylaluminum with water is a really exciting reaction that you don't want to carry out, I think, on a really big scale. You end up with a lot of aluminum in the polymer, as I said, and also a lot of aluminum in the reactor can decrease the molecular weight by chain transfer of So we began looking at these discrete cationic type species. And the idea here is you have the constrained geometry dialkyl complex, and then by reaction with a weak acid, this is tri-alkyl ammonium with an extremely non-nucleophilic anion. This is the tetrachytanofluorophilic anion. You can generate a cationic open center at the uh, at the metal by protonation of a methyl group off as methane. You end up with a three mean these uh, constrained geometry cationic species and this extremely non-nucleophilic, non-fluorinating, fluorinated anion. You end up with very high activity, and it's unlike the MAO system, only one of these co-catalysts for titanium. Uh, unfortunately for us, running a solution process in hot kerosene, uh, 
ammonium salts and other salts like co-catalysts are not very hydrocarbon soluble, as you can imagine, and the amine is probably weakly coordinated. We were able, however, to get several patents on this. Uh, I like, I brought this slide particularly because Leo Manzer, who uh, introduced me, first used this ligand, we call this the Manzer ligand. Um, it's a, a great stabilizing ligand. The orthodimethylamino benzyl group, uh, we used it to stabilize the titanium-3 constrained geometry complex, which would not be very stable uh, without this good stabilizing ligand. And then you can use an oxidizing agent such as ferrocinium, again with this uh, very non-nucleophilic anion to generate the outer sphere uh, oxidation. The titanium-3 up to titanium-4 can be an extremely active catalyst. These things practically explode in the reactor with ethylene. But unfortunately, because again, we have a salt co-catalyst, there's no hydrocarbon solubility, and it's very difficult for us to control the polarization. So the solution was go to a neutral co-catalyst, uh, trispenafluorophenyl borane, which is an extremely powerful Lewis acid. What this does is extract one of the methyl groups from the constrained geometry titanium dimethyl complex as shown here. It's so uh, Lewis acidic, it just yanks one of the methyl groups off the form. Again, a very non nucleophilic anion, the methyl crisp pentafluorophenyl borate, and this cationic titanium species with a very open coordination site. And we get very, very high efficiency in the solution of polymerization. We've gotten over 30 million grams of polymer per gram of uh, catalyst. So commercially now, Efficiencies like this, uh, even though these materials are relatively expensive, you can afford to use them to make a commodity product such as uh, polyethylene. There's a very high efficiency, the catalyst cost per pound of, uh, of polymer is very low. And both starting materials, the titanium dimethyl and this neutral boring, because they're neutral, are soluble in hydrocarbons, so it's very easy to control the addition of the catalyst to the reactor. Okay, so the kind of polymer that we get out with this system, as I mentioned, for a normal homogeneous type polymer, all the chains are the same as I've shown in this cartoon. Uh, for a heterogeneous catalyst, you get low molecular weight molecules with lots of branches, and high molecular weight molecules with very few branches. With these metallocene type catalysts, all the chains are about the same length, and they all have about the same amount of homonomer on them. One of the features you expect from a situation like that and this is a real problem, is with a narrow molecular weight distribution, because we've removed all of the low molecular weight greasy molecules, those molecules serve to make the, the polymer more processable. They don't add much to the physical properties, but they sure make it easier to process. And so a, a broad molecular weight distribution, heterogeneous Ziegler nanopolymer, if we look at the rheology, this is a dynamic viscosity versus shear rate. In other words, the harder we're forcing it through a dye in the, in the melt, the lower the viscosity, it's a relatively non-Newtonian uh, fluid. If we go to a narrow molecular weight distribution, the shear response is, uh, is much less. So it takes a lot of force then to, to force these polymers through a, uh, a dye. And people who process polymers don't like that force. It, it's, uh, it's very expensive and they process relatively slowly. But we were very surprised when we looked at the rheology of these uh, inside materials. If we look at this rheological property I10, I2, it's the ratio of the melt index with a relatively heavy uh, weight under high shear conditions for the melt index under low shear conditions. And you'd expect uh, a ratio of about five and a half for that for a narrow molecular weight distribution of two. In fact, the way you increase typically the I10, I2, which is a processability index, is to broaden the molecular weight distribution. So what you would do in the past is trade physical properties, which you would lose by increasing the molecular weight distribution for processability. And what we found is that we could get extremely high processable materials with I10, I2 of 11 or higher, yet we maintain a very narrow molecular weight distribution. Initially, this didn't make any sense at all. Uh, another key piece of data was the relatively high melt tension we saw with these materials. Uh, typically, linear low density polyethylenes are not known for good melt tension or melt strength. Uh, yet these had very high melt tension, and again, independent of a molecular weight distribution, which was something new. Uh, they had very reduced tendency to melt fracture, as is shown by this uh, apparent shear stress versus apparent shear rate. When you get melt fracture, where the polymer literally comes apart as you force it out of high pressure, uh, 
our Dalex material, which we consider to be a very high, easy process of a material with non fracture at uh, a shear stress of about 3 million dynes per square centimeter. If these inside materials, uh, you could make them so they would not melt fracture at all. And you probably can't see this very well, but the inside extruded out from coming out of a fine dye is very smooth. And uh, if we were able to see this better, you see there's a lot of banding on this uh, resin as the uh, polymer comes apart out of the dye. This is a very important property for uh, people who mold polymers. You get a nice shiny film with no melt fracture. It becomes very rough uh, with melt fracture. Well, the bottom line is we get a tremendous amount of long chain branching uh, in these products with our inside. Running in a continuous high temperature solution process, we essentially generate uh, long chain branch or T-shaped polymer molecules. They're not linear molecules like uh, low density polyethylene. Now, how do we do it? They, uh, we get a tremendous amount of beta hydride elimination and the high temperature solution polymerization, basically generating uh, C3000, C5000 alpha olefins. So polymer molecules are extremely large alpha olefins. With a normal Ziegler Natick catalyst, the reactivity ratio for higher alpha olefins falls off very steeply. Uh, even butene and, and octane are relatively unreactive, so you end up with a linear chain. But because these catalysts are wide open sterically and they're very hungry for large alpha olefins, the uh, vinyl terminated polymer ends up being another co-monomer. So we end up with a polymer that is a copolymer of ethylene and say a C8. Co-monomer as well as a C3000 co-monomer, and you end up with these T-shaped molecules. And uh, again, that can be shown with a normal Ziegler catalyst looking at the reactivity ratio this time, R, the kinetic R2, uh, falls off very steeply with increasing carbon number and levels out around uh, uh, olefin carbon number of 20. Yet our inside the catalyst, the reactivity ratio is about two orders of magnitude higher. So it's about 100 times more reactive than large alpha olefin than standard Ziegler Natick catalysts. And you can quantify this very nicely with high field NMR for uh, ethylene homopolymers. Unambiguously, you can find the branch piece. And uh, the number of long chain branches per chain correlates very nicely with this uh, processability index. The high processability index correlates beautifully with the uh, amount of long chain branching per chain. Uh, notice that even at the extremely high processable uh, materials, we end up with somewhat less than one long chain branch per chain. Uh, another distinctive feature of these catalysts is the ability to make uh, just the kind of polymer molecule we want, as I mentioned before. This cartoon shows the uh, typical polyethylene consists of crystallized, where the chain is folded back and forth uh, to form a lamella type crystal. And then there's tie chains that, that tie between these. And when you pull the resin apart, if you look at the physical properties, what happens is you get initial stiffness from this very high crystalline fraction breaking up. And then as you continue to pull, you'll eventually pull out the, the tie chains that link these crystals together. So tie chains are very, very important for having a high strength material. You want a chain that links together a lot of these different crystallites to give you a very strong polyethylene. And what are the requirements to do that? You've got to have enough crystallinity in the chain such that it can fold up in this uh, lamella. And yet it has to have a defect, a, a comonomer branch, so it will kick it out of the chain, wander around the amorphous region, and yet have enough chain length and comonomer content so that it can, again, wind up and crystallize in another uh, lamella. It turns out that the requirements for such a, uh, a chain have been known for some number of years. Uh, you want to have there's an optimum density. If you have too much comonomer branching, then it will crystallize enough. If you have too little, it will crystallize too much and won't kick out of one chain and go in another. And the molecular weight, you know, the, the percentage of uh, theoretical tie chains that can be made is a function of the molecular weight. You want very high molecular weight chains that have a specified amount of comonomer on them. In the past, it's not been possible to deliberately make such molecules, but with the talcenes, you can do that very nicely. And by blending in a deliberate tie chain fraction molecules with just the right amount of homonomer and just the right molecular weight, you can end up with vastly improved enhanced polyethylene. And we've just announced the commercialization of, of what we call enhanced polyethylene that has a, a mix 
mixture of this metallocene generated high chain molecule with the conventional Ziegler Nata uh, catalyst. And you get extremely tough uh, resins. The dark impact or the, the basic the ability to uh, puncture, for example, a garbage bag if you wanted with, uh, with these new resins is very, very high, much higher than the conventional polyethylene at a given modulus. So we can have a very uh, tough, very strong bag that's still very stiff. And basically, it, it changes the rules of how you can put together a, uh, a polyethylene molecule. The future outlook, I think, for these catalysts is great because of the ability to logically control what's going on. You can control the tacticity, as I mentioned, for higher alpha olefins, make isotactic, syniotactic polypropylene, syniotactic polystyrene, all new materials that are moving into commercialization right now at uh, many of the big polyolefin companies. The growth is predicted to be multi-billion pounds a year. We're getting very close to that now. We have about 400 million pounds a year of our insight technology, polyethylene capacity right now, and it's growing very rapidly. There's an extremely high level of innovation because you can logically control what's going on at the catalyst site and make just the kind of polymer molecules that you want. There's a zillion patents being filed. It's impossible to keep up with this, uh, with this area. You spend all day just reading the patents. There's a tremendously high level of R&D expenditure, estimated to be 600 to 700 million dollars a year. So obviously the companies are expecting uh, big returns on this. Finally, to wrap it up, these new catalysts are being rapidly commercialized just over the past few years. We start off our first plant in 1993, and it's on rapidly to about 400 million pounds a year now. They have unique monomer capability that's leading to a lot of new materials. But the most important feature is this logical structure property relationship that gives you a tremendous degree of control over the tacticity and the individual polymer molecule composition. Uh, because we can introduce long chain branching, we can overcome many of the limitations of the conventional uh, metallocene type technology. And I really expect a very high level of uh, innovation to continue. I'd like to finish up by thanking the uh, organizing committee again for inviting me to speak and thanking you for your time.